Hello, welcome to the fourth lecture in the Land Borders and Health series, which is also the 2022 annual John R. Events Lecture in Global Health. My name is Andrea Cortino and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And to start, we would like to acknowledge the land we are on and those of us who are in Toronto today. We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Odenoshone Indigenous peoples on which the University of Toronto now stands. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon, One Spoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iraqis Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We would also like to pay our respects to all our ancestors and to our present elders and knowledge keepers. We reflect on the colonialism, broken treaties, forced displacement, genocide, state sanction, oppression, violence, racism, and injustices perpetrated against indigenous peoples over hundreds of years and ongoing today. As we discuss human-human and human-environment relations and the urgent need to rediscover a balanced relationship with our planet, let us be honest about our complicity in upholding the status quo and let us honor our responsibility to change at the individual, institutional and systemic levels. Today we have another exceptional, powerful speaker, Dr. Rupa Maria from the University of California, San Francisco, whom will be introduced in a minute by Professor Erika Di Ruggiero. I admire and refer back often to Dr. Maria's analysis of the links between colonialism and the industrial and technological revolutions and the multiple hierarchies of violence, racial, patriarchal and androcentric, all finalized to the exploitation of land and labor in support of the myth of infinite growth. We are also grateful to have with us today Professor Blake Poland and Carlos Sanchez Pimienta, who will be acting as discussants. I would like to introduce our host and moderator for today, Dr. Erika Di Ruggiero, an associate professor at the Dalana School of Public Health, Director of the Center for Global Health and Director of the Collaborative Specialization in Global Health. One final announcement, that due to Omicron, we had to reschedule Dr. Kayum Ahmed lecture on the right to health at the border between human and non-human that was originally scheduled for May 13th. The lecture has been rescheduled for Friday, June 10th at 12 p.m. EDT or, or Toronto time. To make sure you receive the Zoom link for that lecture, please go back to the even bright land borders and health event collection and register for the new date. All lectures in this series are recorded and the recordings will be made available through the website of the Dalana School of Public Health. So again, welcome and Erica, please. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that lovely introduction and a warm welcome to our panelists and to everyone joining us um, online. So as Andrea mentioned, I'm Erica Di Ruggiero and I'm the director of the Center for Global Health at the uh, Dalana School of Public Health and we're delighted to co-host this um, series and also this particular uh, seminar with um, Andrea, who is leading the Public Health Migration Initiative at our school and across the university. So today we're actually um, uh, also hosting this seminar in the context of an annual seminar series that we run in honor of the late John R. Evans, which is a lectureship in global health. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with this lectureship, the John R. Evans Lectureship in Global Health was first established by um, one of our former presidents at the university, Dr. David Naylor, um, when he was actually the Dean of Medicine and then he became the, the president of the university and also as part of the former Center for International Health Research Conference, which was led by one of our colleagues, David Zakis. This inaugural keynote um, was delivered by Dr. John Evans at that conference, and we've built on the momentum since then to really highlight critical global health um, issues. And I can't think of a better speaker to address these issues of land and border through um, a decolonial lens. And I want to also thank Blake and Carlos for joining um, our panel today. 
So um, I just want to go through a few uh, minor housekeeping notes. Um, after we've heard from the, our keynote speaker and the two discussants, um, we will entertain your questions and we will try to um, answer as many questions as possible. You can direct any comments or reactions or questions to a particular panelist using the Q&A function on this webinar. And um, we'll also drop the email address um, in the chat in case we don't get to all of them. So without further ado, it's really my distinct pleasure to um, introduce our keynote speaker. Um, I could go on and on about all of these speakers and I know they're very illustrious biographies for research related. But a warm welcome to Dr. Ruta Luria, who is a physician and an activist, a writer, a mother, and a composer. And as Andrea mentioned, she's an associate professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, where she practices and teaches um, internal medicine. And her work actually sits um, at the nexus of blind health and racial justice. She's a co-founder of the Do No Harm Coalition, a collective of health workers committed to addressing disease. Um, through structural change and many, many other accolades. Um, she was also appointed by Governor Newsom to the Healthy California for All Commission to advance a model for universal health care. So a warm welcome to Dr. Maria. And I will also just briefly introduce our discussants and then we'll uh, turn things over to uh, our speakers. So Blake Poland, who's I'm sure well known to many of you if you're connected to the school, he is a professor and the head of the Social and Behavioral Health Sciences Division at the Dallana School of Public Health, and he directs the Collaborative Specialization in Community Development, and also co-chairs the National Ecological Determinants Group on Education. His work really focuses on community resilience, community development as an area of work for health and social care professionals, sustainability transitions and social movements as agents of change. And Carlos Sanchez Pimenta is a Vanier scholar and a PhD student at the Dalana School of Public Health. And his work um, draws on post-colonial theory and indigenous ways of knowing. And he's particularly interested in unsettling uh, mainstream understandings of planetary health education. So a warm welcome to this amazing panel. And so I'll turn things over to you, Rupa, to kick us off and look forward to our discussion. And thanks to you all for joining. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. Um, I'm so grateful to be here and to be a part of this uh, discussion and a part of this series, this amazing series you all have put together. Today, um, we're going to talk about deep medicine um, <clears throat> and the care revolution. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge where I'm speaking to you from. I was born and raised in occupied and unceded Ramatush Ohlone territory, where I am sitting right now in the room of my, my mother's home. Um, so it's great. I'm grateful to be here. Um, I work as a physician up in the ancient village of Yalamu, what is now called San Francisco, um, where I practice hospital medicine and um, working on a land project in southern Ramatish territory um, on the coast to move the land back to our indigenous community. And it's been one of the most profound things that I've been involved in as, as a healing person. Um, I come from an ancestry of Punjab, uh, from the Punjab region of India. Um, so my my parents moved here from India because of the 62-ish trillion dollars um, that were stolen um, during times of British colonization of India, and the poverty that that left there. Um, my family moved here for a better life for their children. Um, and so it's been, you know, a profound experience for me to be learning with and from um, Indigenous community members and members of people from diaspora from around the world um, who have found themselves settled in these territories and to ask questions about how we unsettle and how we enter different kinds of relationships. I'll be speaking to you today with knowledge that was garnered through those conversations, as well as through my work as a musician. Um, so often in medicine, people like to you know, dissect our identities and say, well, that's your hobby over there and you're really a physician. But in fact, the, the, the stories and the things that I will share today are insights that I gathered largely through the work in music. 
um, because when you travel around the world with a guitar, um, you have a different kind of relationship than if you're going with your stethoscope and research pad. And the ways in which music for me has been a tool of investigation and a way of sharing and exchange um, has deepened my understanding and knowledge <clears throat> of the things that I'm bringing to you today. So um, I'll speak to you today from all of those identities, including as a mother and as including as um, a daughter of immigrants myself and someone who's been an immigrant herself. So when we think about um, medicine and deep medicine, um, medicine, or what I call colonial medicine, um, really teaches us how to diagnose things in individuals. So the atomization of individuals shorn of their historical or even their social context. And so the diagnoses that we are given by looking increasingly at smaller parts, whether it's an individual or in their organ system or in their gene or their protein that's malfunctioning, it's a very limited way of um, understanding systems level interactions. Actually, you can't understand systems level interactions. And when we're facing systems level disruptions, as such as with pandemic and climate collapse, um, it's clear that the diagnoses that we've been handed through enlightenment era thought patterns are insufficient to addressing the scope of the problem that we are facing. So what um, Raj Patel and I did in our book Inflame was advance a higher order of diagnosis. Um, a diagnosis that incorporates history and power and how those sediment in the body and how those have altered our landscapes and our relationships. And through the altering of those landscapes and relationships, whether they are relationships within our body to our own microbiota or relationships of our peoples between each other or people to the entire web of life, the fracturing of those relationships through um, the systems that were brought during colonization have um, left our bodies and the world and our societies inflamed. And um, so as we know with you know, a diagnosis, if you're working with the wrong diagnosis, not only do you get the, the wrong, you know, not, you're not really addressing the problem at the root, but you might actually have the wrong treatment. Um, and I, I think of a, a recent story where I went into the hospital and I picked up my panel of patients and there was an elder there, a black um, elder, <clears throat> who was in the hospital for two weeks by the time I met her with a um, sickle cell crisis on her, um, you know, that was her diagnosis that was given in the emergency room because she had shoulder pain. Uh, well, I happened to know this person because I had helped her son die. He was 24 years old and died in, of lymphoma. They lived in the Bayview Hunters Point district of San Francisco where radioactive waste has been deposited from the ships that blew up the atom bombs in the Pacific. Um, and her son died years before, and I saw her there. I was like, what are you doing here with a sickle? I didn't even know you had sickle cell disease. And she said, well, I do, but I haven't had a pain crisis in 25 years. And so I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. So what happened? Like, did something catastrophic happen? She's like, no, it's just, you know, shoulder pain. And, and we sat and we talked. And, and then after some time, she said the key phrase, you know, doc, this pain is so bad, it wakes me up at night. And I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's a rotator cuff tear. That's what we learn in medicine. You know, if someone says that I've got shoulder pain that's so bad, it wakes me up at night. It's a rotator cuff tear. Um, and in fact, so I examined her and it was a rotator cuff tear, got an MRI. She got, you know, seen by physical therapy and a referral to sports medicine. And these are outpatient treatments. So here's this woman who was admitted for two weeks, put on IV opiates, put on IV fluids and, and oxygen, the wrong treatments for something that is an outpatient, outpatient condition. So that's why it's so critical that we have the right diagnosis. And every diagnosis, as you know, is a story told out of order. You know, the history of present illness um, starts when someone's well, goes back in time, you know, starts when something had happened, sorry, then you go back in time and go up to that moment when something changed. And the hope with a proper diagnosis is that you can remedy um, what's wrong and, you know, move that body back to health, back, back to balance. And when you're talking about a story, every story, the time and place matter. And the time and place that we must look at, if we're looking at the scourge of inflammatory disease, which is the bulk of all diseases of modern industrialized societies, as well as the um, planet that is currently on fire, um, is, is um, the time and place is about 600 years ago at the dawn of colonial capitalism. And we can say, oh, well, humans have always colonized different territories, and that's true. People have moved around and settled and, and fought um, and, and you know, conquered different territories. 
but never has there been such a destructive system of economics paired with that colonialism as there is with modern capitalism. So that's why we talk about colonial capitalism. And what colonial capitalism requires is axes of domination, and we just listed a few here, but there's several more, that um, sever critical relationships of humans to each other and humans to their relationships and duties to the world around them, to the web of life and the, the ecologies that support their health. And through the fracturing of those relationships, the outcome is inflammation. And while we, when we talk about this, you know, it might sound like a metaphor, um, what we realized, uh, Raj and I, as we were writing our book and researching it, was that um, this isn't simply a metaphor. This is actually, a, a, this is actually what's happening inside the body. <clears throat> Inflammation, the inflammatory response, is an ancient evolutionarily conserved response of the innate immune system to damage or the threat of damage. So when I learned about the immune system in medical school and even in undergraduate school, um, we learned that, you know, you basically have the border of the self and then all these white blood cells are your police force surveying the borders and of yourself and fending off any foreign invaders um, and destroying, you know, other and distinguishing self from non-self. Um, and that actually isn't true. And if you think about that language of the, the, the bordering and the policing, that language and understanding came about in a time of colonization. Um, as with, you know, Western medicine was developing and the language of science has always followed the political language of its day and era. And what we really know about the immune system is that it's not so much a police bordering because that doesn't explain why the millions of uh, microbes inside you are actually totally necessary for the turning on and off of your immune um, system's genes, for the proper development of your brain, of your endocrine system. Um, so that, you know, self and other becomes very blurred when you think that your optimum health and your proper development is actually um, dependent on all of these others that live in and on you. Um, and so what we know about the immune system, especially with inflammation, is that it's responding to damage. It's responding to the threat of damage. And that damage, um, when you think about it as a paper cut, so an acute inflammatory event, with a paper cut, those damaged signals in the cells are released, they circulate in the blood, and they recruit other cells, white blood cells and other um, mediators, to come and repair that wound. And those um, cells and mediators come to the site of damage and work to repair the wound. And when the wound is repaired, the, the inflammatory signal goes quiet. Well, what happens when that damage signal, or the threat of damage, which is stress, continues unabated. What happens then is those SOS signals that are being sent by our distressed cells continue to go unabated. And what was once a healing response um, when it goes un, uh, when it when it goes without ending becomes a damaging response. So the inflammatory response because something that incurs more damage. And this is what we're seeing in chronic sterile inflammatory disease which makes up the bulk again of the diseases that I treat from cardiovascular to cancer to end stage liver and um, you know, kidney failure to um, Alzheimer's dementia and even severe COVID. Um, so this is what is happening um, in our bodies. When we think about the locus of pathology in Western medicine, we see that it's, it, it really has been honed in on the individual, not only that, but it's evolved to look deeply at the individual organ or the individual gene, again, the individual protein. Um, and the locus of pathology, you know, in, in Western medicine um, was very fuzzy until about the 1800s when a French physiologist, Poussai, really advances this concept of um, medical physiology and pathophysiology by locating inflammation and pathology in a space and time in the body. And this was a real medical revolution because before that we were describing, um, you know, humors that were circulating and, um, you know, miasmas, um, but this actually located that, you know, when you have inflammation in your joint, you have an arthritis, you have something actually happening there in the body. Um, and that allowed us to tailor treatments and tailor um, medical treatments to address those things in the body. 
Well, in the 1840s, as Europe was aflame with revolution um, from an increasingly disgruntled urban proletariat who were chafing against the exploitation of the working class in the, in, in the era of you know, um, the beginnings of um, capitalism, a young German doctor was recognizing that, you know, it, it, it isn't simply um, just something happening in the body. It's the, the situation around the body that is priming the body's response. Um, and this concept um, was really furthered in the 2000s and the aughts with the concept of the exposome. So the exposome is um, defined as the sum of a lifetime's exposures of a person from conception to death. Um, but it actually even extends beyond that. Um, it extends to your ancestors and histories of intergenerational trauma. It extends to the structures of power around you, the way that you understand your place in the world, and even the stories you're told as a child, whether the police are there to help you or hurt you. Those things are all part of the exposome. And the exposome um, is more predictive of the development of chronic inflammatory disease than the genome. When you look at all the research dollars from the NIH in the United States, the bulk of research dollars to look at chronic inflammatory disease is going to genetic study. But all of the science is showing us that the bulk of the cause of chronic inflammatory disease is not in the genome, it's in the exposome. Um, and this is important because what we're seeing is that the exposome constructed through colonial capitalism is toxic for most human beings, actually for all of us. Even if you're you know, wealthy and elite, you will be forced to somehow breathe the same air as other people on planet Earth. And that's becoming increasingly, you can't divide the sky. It's becoming increasingly difficult as we see here in the Bay Area with now six weeks of fire season every year where the AQI is um, so toxic for human health. So when I think of this, I understand the immune system as something that harmonizes with the exposome. So if the exposome is toxic, you're gonna get inflammation. If the exposome is something that is constructed through care, you're not gonna have the same burden of chronic inflammatory disease. And we see that with communities that are living in with um, intact relationships to each other and the web of life. I was recently visited by Waroni indigenous activist Nimonte Nenkemo, who um, is from the Amazon in Ecuador. She um, is living amongst several uncontacted tribes in the Amazon. And COVID ripped through their communities three times. So, so a few people got tested, but everyone got sick. Um, and um, there are about 2,500 people who got sick. Of that, not one person died. Not one person died. All of the Warani fatalities from mortality from um, COVID came from the communities who were living on the border towns. So the towns where the petroleum industry workers were living amongst the indigenous people, which I found really fascinating. So what is it about the exposome of our indigenous communities that is different? Um, and how does that um, protect them against the development of inflammatory disease? <clears throat> when we look at what's happening in our bodies, translating the socio-environmental down into the um, physiological, we see some interesting things. So in every replicating cell of the body that is not a germline cell, when those cells are exposed to the damage um, from a toxic exposome, that damage is registered in the body through oxidative stress, telomere erosion, DNA damage, um, some epigenetic changes and um, changes of mitochondrial dysfunction. Cells that replicate, that accumulate this damage over time, stop replicating and they enter a premature cell cycle arrest, premature aging through damage. Cells that enter this early senescence through damage undergo a remodeling of their genetic information and take on a phenotype called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. These SASP cells, which exist in all of our tissues where cells are replicating, <clears throat> become pro-inflammatory mediator factories. So they're pumping out all of these pro-inflammatory mediators, which end up creating microenvironments of the tissue of inflammation um, and um, systemic inflammation. So you can find these elevated markers of inflammation throughout the body. 
This is important because we're finding these SASP cells in all of these diseases. So in the blood vessels of people with atherosclerosis, in the liver cells of people with liver fibrosis. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is um, now the leading cause of liver failure in the United States, surpassing alcoholic liver disease, is an inflammatory condition. Alzheimer's, we're seeing it in the microglial cells of the brain. We're finding these cells in the pancreas in people with diabetes. We're finding it in people circulating, um, circulating um, SASP cells in people who have severe COVID. Um, so they're predisposing the body to poor outcomes. And when you look at the outcomes here in the United States from COVID, and unfortunately these disparities haven't changed, our Black and Indigenous and Latino populations have experienced the worst, most severe cases of COVID. That is not simply because they have worse access to healthcare in our capitalist for-profit healthcare system. It is also because their bodies have been primed or their immune systems have been tuned to this toxic exposome, not only in their lifetimes, but through their ancestral um, generations. Um, so it sets them up for failure in, um, in the event of ex ex experiencing something like COVID. For me, this understanding is like if a toxic exposome includes systemic racism, that racism is a form of biological warfare because it is, it is creating the body's um, self-destruction over time. <clears throat> we have to remember, you know, when we look at those rates um, that, you know, even if someone gets access to healthcare, they're not going to get, you know, the best outcomes, not only because of their predispositions, but because the medical system itself is also a form of, it's also structured through colonial capitalist um, mindset. Modern medicine has always been a part of the colonial trifecta um, with missionaries, militaries, and medics um, were used to justify the conquering of other people's lands and the theft of their labor. Um, and so when we see headlines like this in the United States, it really shouldn't shock us because black folks and um, women identified people have always been disposal, uh, disposable in colonial architectures. This is not something that can be, you know, DEI trained out <laughs> of a system. This is actually baked into the system um, and requires structural change. So when we think of like how we're being taught as physicians today um, and how we're being um, the solutions that are being posited for climate collapse, um, we have to be very skeptical of ones that are coming out of the mindset that has been really structured through the, you know, the persistent enlightenment errors. Um, so Cartesian dualism, which, you know, persists today in, in medicine with this, you know, false dichotomies of, again, self versus other, um, of, of um, mind versus body, um, becomes very, uh, very, it's a very crass way of looking at things when we see where even the science is taking us, that these systems that we've developed to understand anatomy, even the immune system, the endocrine system, even the gut um, and distinguishing it somehow from the immune system or the nervous system, these systems are not distinct. These systems are much more um, fluid. Um, and, and it's important to understand how our limitations that have been put forth through these enlightenment ideas that persist um, limit us to seeing the actual um, science today in its full capacity, as well as um, solutions. And so I think any concepts of progress that are coming out of colonial capitalist ideas must be looked at um, with skepticism. Um, and I think about this concept of progress, which continues um, to, you know, um, persist in our and our understandings um, of, you know, both in terms of global development or, um, you know, our own ways of addressing climate change. And I have to think of um, the example of the transcontinental railroad, um, which is often lauded as like the great, the great thing of the industrial revolution, like we have this railroad. Um, and um, the transcontinental railroad, you know, required the um, you know, the decimation and um, slaughter of, you know, I think the largest genocide of mammals in, the, in human history, which was the, the, the killing slaughter of the buffalo, which was used also as a genocidal tactic against the plains people, the tribes of the plains, um, and a way to clear the land for the railroad and for colonization. When you look at the historic range of the buffalo, which is in the light pink, and then you look at the um, you know, range of the Plains people who are really following the buffalo and um, in deep relationship with the buffalo. 
And then you look at the outline here of the prairie grasslands. So the tall, short, um, and medium prairie grasslands, you see a very sophisticated kind of relationship that existed for tens of thousands of years. Um, and this relationship um, really altered the ecosystem or cultivated the ecosystem, maintained an ecosystem that was um, really characterized by health. And the, the prairie grasslands, if you look at the different, the depths of the roots of the prairie grasses, which hardly exist anymore, the native prairie grasses root systems go bow, down at least like 20 or 30 feet deep as far as that. And the, the root system of the prairie grasslands really held that soil together as well as created avenues for water to trickle down into um, the soil and down into the um, groundwater um, underneath. And so what are um, the indigenous communities who lived on these grasslands would notice the way when lightning would strike and set off these fires, um, that the next year the grass would grow greener and thicker and, and denser, and that following year the buffalo would be more attracted to those places. And so they learned to use fire as a way to um, act as a disturbance regime, to move the buffalo and to cultivate the grass. And this um, long relationship of moving buffalo, hunting buffalo, disturbance through the buffalo and the fire um, ended up um, ultimately um, being responsible for the development of the largest uh, freshwater collection on planet Earth. Um, my friend and soil scientist Lila June Johnston, Danae um, scholar and artist, really believes that this aquifer is a human created phenomenon um, through these kinds of systems of interrelationships. Well, now the uh, Oglala aquifer is drying up. Um, it's, it's no longer the largest um, freshwater source on planet Earth. And um, when the colonists moved in um, and cleared the land, um, they couldn't cultivate the land because the roots were so deep, that the sod was so thick. So John Deere invented this in the 1800s, the moldboard plow to till the land and to cut the earth. And through that cutting of the earth, severing these ancient relationships of soil and roots and grass and replacing it with, you know, wheat and corn and soy. And what happened, you know, this extremely fertile land um, within a matter of a few decades um, turned into this. And the, the, the ca catastrophic effect of um, soil destruction, which we're seeing around the world, is posing a health problem and a, and a, and a food system problem and a climate change problem um, for all of us. Um, so it's this short-sighted concept of progress that has led us here. Um, and when we think about, you know, the, the, the poor health of the, the soil, we also have to look at the Ocheti Shakoan and the, the folks of um, the Pine Ridge community in Lakota um, territory have some of the worst health indices on planet, you know, on the, on the Western Hemisphere, second only to Haiti. Um, so the, the amount of destruction that has come that is manifested in poor health and all of the you know problems that we're seeing in our uh in the pine ridge community are our problems of chronic inflammatory disease these are the outcome of disrupted relationships <laughs> and if we think that this is just history this is my drive through um, the central valley of california where the same you know phenomenon is happening and um the soils that used to be very thick um you know several feet deep of the richest topsoil um, has now been, you know, it's only a couple inches, six inches, and it's aerosolized um, through the tillage and the, the violent use of chemical weaponry on the soils, killing the microbiology and all of those relationships. Colonial capitalist logic is causing the destruction of our bodies and the destruction of um, our, our own health because it fails to address systems level interactions. And in fact, it seeks to invisibilize those system level interactions um, in order to exploit and extract. Um, it defines and limits personhood and through that rights and responsibilities, whether that personhood are humans, um, immigrants, or um, folks from Africa who were brought over as slaves, um, or whether that personhood is a mountain or a river. Um, and once those, um, once those limits are defined, um, so are those rights and, and our duties um, of care for those entities or people. It is based on extractivism and it creates and militantly enforces these borders again around these limits and definitions. 
it atomizes individuals and reproduces itself through systems of enforced education. It severs the relationships between people and between us in the web of life. And this severance is leading to inflammatory disease and the inflammation of our planet. When I look at, this is our, I took a screenshot of our workflow at UCSF and someone's admitted and the whole group of people got together for like five years and said, let's make a structural social determinants of health thing and put it in every patient chart. And I was like, okay, is it going to include people's experiences of colonial violence and racism and all these things? And they're like, no, 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 we're going to ask them if they smoke and if they drink. And I'm like, but what's driving them to smoke and drink? And they're like, no, 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 we can't talk about that. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's way too, that's way too, um, explosive. We have to just, you know, limit it again to their individual choices. Um, so I see this as like the liberal, the liberal problem. Um, and, and the problem of liberalism is not really getting at the root cause of what's going on and actually prolonging the suffering. The social determinants of the health really need to look at history and power and need to be uh, fluent in these um, issues and how racial capitalism is making it um, so that people are vulnerable, so that people are hungry, so that people are um, being exploited. And once we understand that, we, we have to see that we have to change the structures of um, racial capitalism um, to we have to change the structures of oppression to change the outcomes of disease. And this is where Raj and I um, advance this concept of deep medicine. We were tearing a page from the concept of deep ecology. So deep ecology being um, ecology that exists outside of its service for human beings, ecology that exists as systems level health. Um, deep medicine is medicine that exists outside of the obsession with the individual, but looks at whole systems. So if you can find systems that harmonize well together, health becomes an emergent phenomenon. It's not simply a, a, a characteristic of one individual. Um, it's understanding how history and lines of power, again, sediment in the body and, and, and sediment in the world around us. And understanding that to do this work, we have to start with dismantling systems of hierarchy, even in medicine, because the knowers of medicine have really been, um, you know, a consecrated class of physician scientists and not even the nurses who work by our sides, um, not even the, the other um, healers who have been um, part of the ecosystems of health of people outside of the hospital. We have to admit other systems of knowing. Um, so is deep medicine throwing away Western medicine with all of its, or Western science with all of its histories of violence? No, it's not. It's, it's reckoning with it and understanding how our ways of knowing have been perverted through the political orientations of colonial capitalism. And it's expanding the peer of peer review. So not, um, not throwing away science, but making it more complicated, um, making it more um, richer. Um, through the admission of other peers into peer review. Deep medicine requires the repair of relationships between um, each other, between all humans and the web of life. And it actually requires the exercising of our radical imaginations, because if we cannot imagine structures that are different, um, we won't be able to create them. We start with abolishing capitalism, understanding that capitalism and colonial capitalism are the root causes of the destruct destruction that we're seeing both in our bodies and our ecologies around us, starting in things like healthcare and things that directly impact health. Um, we work with partnering with communities to develop new economic models that center care. Um, and this is called, again, the care revolution, which is already happening all around the world in um, experiments in communities that are advancing new and old economies. Um, deep medicine requires denying the logic of the nation state of borders and policing and repairing harms um, towards groups that have been most impacted by colonialism. It's nothing short of reimagining the world and understanding that revolution is an act of care and that reforming uh, measures of incrementalism are, are simply um, acts of prolonging the violence and are not tolerable. Deep medicine also looks like this. Um, the, you know, the pipeline resistance in US and Canada um, has been the most successful thing at lowering greenhouse gases, um, the pipeline resistance led by indigenous people. 
Um, we don't hear about that with the climate accords, that actually this is better than what Elon Musk is doing with his electric cars. Um, this is actually more effective at lowering greenhouse gases, and this is the deep medicine we need to follow. And this couldn't be more critical because the Earth's body, like I said, is inflamed like our bodies. Our rivers are dammed. The blockages are there. The blockages of flow of capital and, and finances. They are being controlled, um, you know, for a specific purpose. The forests surround us <clears throat> are on fire the way that our bodies are on fire. And the forests inside us have been felled and denuded through the colonial capitalist logic. The microbiome of modern industrialized people is some of the least biodiverse microbiota on planet Earth. And we know that the microbiome um, in the gut is some of our best defense against chronic inflammatory disease. So those humans who have more biodiversity in their guts are, um, are those, that biodiversity is associated with lower incidence of chronic inflammatory disease. I was shocked in my research to learn that age-related hi um, hypertension, which I thought was just what happened to all humans when we age, that we all get high blood pressure eventually, doesn't exist in indigenous communities in the Amazon doesn't exist in communities that are living um, small scale horticulturalists who are living close to the land. Um, and that to me was fascinating because, you know, modern industrialized children start getting hypertension when they go to school at five and six years old, that, that, that trend starts. Um, and so what is it about the biodiversity of the gut microbiota that is doing this, this protection? And, and how is it that, you know, if you look at, you know, surveying humans from around the world, those uh, folks, who, Yanomami communities living in the Amazon have the most biodiverse guts on earth, and people who live in, you know, the U.S. and urban centers have the least biodiverse guts on earth. Um, and as Raj and I were writing the book, we put in a line in there, you know, we know as we're writing this, some capitalist is out there trying to turn Yanomami shit into gold. And, and it was true, you know, right when the book came out, there was a piece in the New York Times called Rewilding the Gut. And there's, you know, a scientist at Stanford who's plating out Yanomami, um, you know, shit to, to, to create a probiotic pill so that you could just take that pill and and have a wild gut because those indigenous people have ancestral strains of microbes that actually don't exist anymore in modern human beings and those those ancestral strains are phenomenal at preventing inflammatory disease they don't have inflammatory bowel disease they don't have asthma they don't have eczema they don't have um you know psoriasis um all these diseases that have become part and parcel of what we see every day as physicians they just simply don't exist diabetes does not exist um and if you think this is only you have to live in a jungle in the amazon it's not true the most recent um example of humans who were forced into settlement um from a traditional lifestyle like this are the irish travelers these were people who are genetically Irish and ethnically distinct from the, their settled counterparts. And the Irish travelers had, you know, dis diseases associated with poverty, but they did not have inflammatory bowel disease when they lived in their nomadic lifestyles with their big families and their horses and traveled around Ireland. When they were forced into settlement um, in, in 2002, you can see a loss of those ancestral strains of microbes. Um, and to me, this is a, a fascinating um, area of research looking at the microbiota and what it tells us. And so if you think you could pop a pill to you know, get those microbes back, it's not true because those, those microbes won't stay. Those microbes stay in the guts of folks who live in reciprocity with the web of life because of those relationships. The microbiome is a living portrait of those relationships. And we see that those relationships are severed and gone in modern industrialized humans. Indigenous communities living in relationship to the web of life around them not only steward the best um, or most robust biodiversity inside their bodies, but they also steward the greatest biodiversity outside their bodies. Um, and so for us in our book, Inflamed, we really looked at the cosmology, um, the colonial capitalist cosmology, what it requires versus a cosmology that is centered around um, an indig indigenous worldviews. And this isn't one indigenous worldviews, this is a pluriverse of ideas um, that have a lot of similarities, such as reciprocity and care. And so um, we formed in 2000, actually just last year, um, a group called the Deep Medicine Circle here in, in these territories. Um, as a partnership between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people to look at, can we create a system that can advance care in the food system? 
can we start to look at what repair and care would look like here? Um, and so we developed a project called Farming is Medicine to, to, to exemplify what this looks like. You know, does this look like, does revolution have to look like pitchforks and machetes and burning things down? Um, yes, we do agree that fire is medicine, but we also believe that this is where the imagination can be engaged in restructuring power. Um, so can we build a food system that advances this kind of justice? We're working on a, an, on a land um, that is just got its Ramatush name, Tekwe Anawayup, which means honor Mother Earth in Ramatush language. Um, this is a 38 acre farm that we are working to get back into the hands of our indigenous partners, um, the Muchiote Indigenous Land Trust. All the food that we grow here has been given away for free up in the city of San Francisco to people who are made vulnerable through colonial capitalism. Um, and the practices of land care are blending agroecology and traditional ecological knowledge. The farm is located just, you know, a few miles away from where Portola landed and started his brutal conquest of the San Francisco Peninsula um, and is in a beautiful watershed, the San Gregorio watershed, um, where the indigenous elders are seeking to bring back the beaver, the salmon and the tule elk. Um, and, and it's just a, a beautiful restoration work. We also work along this urban rural corridor. So this is a one acre rooftop farm. We are also stewarding called the Rooftop Medicine Farm. That's Elena Reed. She's our farm director. She is Jamaican, Cherokee and Choctaw, just wonderful farmer. Um, and all the food that we grow here is liberated from the market economy to go to um, organizations who work on um, food justice. So from Poor Magazine, who are formerly unhoused people building their own housing, Poor People Led Solutions to um, Poverty, to Moms for Housing, Black mothers who occupied unoccupied houses in Oakland um, for the purpose of housing humans. Um, and um, this has been some really beautiful work. So for us, we were looking at how the food system is structured today. You know, it's based on stolen land. It's based on the, these capitalist principles of extraction and damage um, that lead to um, damage of the soil. The food is less nutrient dense. Um, there's damage of the people from the exploitation of farm workers to the erasure of ind indigenous people on their lands and profit and the, the value leaves the system to very few people's hands and we get a lot of you know bad outcomes for everybody else. Well this is what we call farming as medicine. Um, so we start with getting land back. We reframe farmers as health stewards, not only of growing nutrient dense food, but also through stewarding the soil and the water. We farm under indigenous sovereignty. So all our farming is done together. Um, it's not just regenerative agriculture. It is, it is replacing um, and rehydrating ancient relationships of care. Um, our soil becomes more biodiverse. We live in drought places and with that biodiversity of soil, you get better water retention, you get a spongy effect to the soil, you get greater CO2 sequestration of the soil. We don't have the pollution because we're not putting crap in our soil. Our food is more nutrient dense and we are climate adapting our seeds right now um, to be prepared for drought. Um, and the food that we give to our community is probiotic food and is prebiotic food is what food used to be, which is medicine. Um, we give our food away for free, so we're decommodifying our food. What we're seeing is increased health of our indigenous people. Our farmers are healthier. They're, they make area median income um, wages. Um, they get health care. Um, and the people who eat the food are healthy. Um, we're also looking at these dynamics between um, these systems, the soil systems, the plant systems, the human systems, to see how through care um, we get uh, different kinds of outcomes. So farming as medicine is based on four principles, and this is really about reimagining power. Um, starts with getting land back, and so that that is you know the work that we are doing with our indigenous communities. We reframe farmers as stewards of health and are trying to mobilize funding from the health sector um, into paying farmers excellent wages as the stewards of our health, not just through how they grow the food, but how they take care of the soil and the land. All the food we grow is decommodified. Um, so the food is given away and, and understanding that, you know, human beings have been in relationships to our food for hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years. You know, somebody made those seeds go through the ice age kept them alive. Um, those are part of our human um, cultural resource um, and should not be, should not be um, enslaved through a system that coerces the, you know, the obedience of the poor and the labor of the working class. So we decommodify food and, and reassert food as medicine. 
Um, so this is just what I will leave you with. Systems that were created to uphold the architecture of domination cannot simply be tweaked to become vessels of equity. And that is, you know, the take home point, I hope that you are left with, um, that, you know, this is a, an urgent time for revolutionary thought and action. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Rupa, for that incredible talk and enriching touches on so many facets that I know will be lots of questions. And I was particularly struck by also calling out racial capitalism and how that makes uh, people vulnerable, but also alternatives to dismantling those structures. Um, and so, um, and also uh, how the social, economic, and environmental influences get under the skin, right? So that relationship with body and in our environments. Um, I could go on, but I think those were and it was such a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna invite Blake and then Carlos to offer uh, some reflections. And then um, I would just encourage the audience to start thinking about your questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Erica and, and Dr. Maria in particular for a really such a fascinating, important, um, critical talk that really in my mind carries on the tradition of Rachel Carson and Paul Farmer and so many others and calling attention to these issues. And it frankly so refreshing to see a direct naming of and calling out and a call for dismantling of capitalism, a C word that doesn't get used enough in these public health and medicine circles. And I think also a talk that demonstrates so clearly the power of metaphor and storytelling for making connections in a world wrought asunder by racist and colonial systems of domination that include naturalized worldviews that that privilege certain ways of knowing you know based on an aggregation of data for example that decontextualized from place and persons and um that is based on a on a on an impulse to take apart <laughs> which has had many advantages, but is left us with the ways of seeing ourselves and the world that are deeply problematic in so many of the ways that you brilliantly illustrate here and in your book. And, um, and to me, it makes clear that um, colonize, coloniz colonization is really an ongoing war for the hearts and minds and wallets of those with the power to affect change. Um, and, it's neutralizing and channeling and dissipating and otherwise diffusing the potential for more radical change that would threaten vested interests. And I think we need to also be honest about what those vested interests are. There's, a, there's an outing that needs to happen. And I know that's also invested in systems and so on, but um, uh, sociologist Graham Gambler talks about um, what he calls a greedy bastards hypothesis as a, as a more um, trenchant kind of analysis of the, the relations of power that operate to keep these systems in place. I also want to underscore the brilliance of inflammation as an analytic pathway for understanding the deeply interconnected nature of human and ecosystem health. And what we're understanding also about the microbiome, which you pointed out um, later in your talk as a reflection of the world around us and the, the seamless interconnection. And that this isn't just about popping probiotics. Um, and let's not even talk about the proliferation of use of antimicrobials during COVID and all of the impact on that, right? And what we're seeing in terms of drug resistant infections and so on. I think this is also a really important corrective to the collective colonial pathology of intentionally siloed disconnection and individualization. I was hit by that even this morning listening to CBC radio as I was making my breakfast report on climate change and then a few breaths later have an extended story about the problems in airports and how we need to get better at moving people back into an economy of air travel and so on and normalizing that as if if the two stories were completely disconnected. No comment on how we need to be thinking about these in the same breath and how maybe we need to actually be halting any further investment in airport expansion and denormalizing air travel 
but instead these stories are are completely disconnected it's just a little example of how we do this all the time in our everyday thinking about the world and to me it really um reveals the extent to which um decolonization is required to recover and reimagine ways of being from which we can source you know truly post-colonial systems that center flourishing and not just surviving based um you know, not on a naturalized forms of exploitation and domination, but on living in sacred reciprocity with all life, which I think is really at the core of what we're talking about here. And a shift from a transactional worldview, which has been the Western mind way, um, to a, a, a much more deeply relational worldview. And the ways in which you show those connections from the microbiome and the exposome right up to the systems of racial colonization um, that are inevitably embodied in all of us, I think is, is really such a, a beautiful way of drawing attention to that, that need for a much more relational worldview. And to me, I also, I think a reminder that relationship and resilience are the natural order of things. The disconnection and the naturalization of domination take ongoing incessant work to create and uphold. We tend to think we have to work at reconnecting, at rehumanizing, at re, you know, um, emphasizing relationship. But in fact, those are the natural order of things. And um, the book that came out a few years ago on, called Humankind, I think was a lovely example of how our very notions of human nature have been twisted, sometimes based on falsified evidence <laughs> in the research that led to this notion that competition and domination are somehow inherently human nature characteristics rather than ones that have been incessantly supported and normalized through existing systems. And I think that invites a very different way of working when we see that, in fact, relationship and resilience are, are natural, that they're, that they're what we can default to when we stop incessantly interfering with, with natural systems and with um, human collectivities. And I think the other piece that I wanted to emphasize here is the ways in which uh, colonization is both individual and collective work and decolonization in particular. I'm sorry, that's what I meant to say. And, and how important social movements are as key agents of change. Um, and the examples that you gave at the end of what we might call prefigurative politics of citizen-led social movement work to um, imagine different futures, I think are so key. And um, I, I often wonder about the extent to which sustainability and our um, converging crises of human and ecosystem health are in fact crises of failures of imagination. And I'm really struck by Jameson's quote, um, or a quote that's attributed to Frederick Jameson, that we can more easily imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I think about Elon Musk's very public, you know, uh, claims that um, we we need to colonize other planets because, <laughs> you know, we're, we, this one is unrecoverable. And um, to me, that's such a crisis of imagination. Um, and I think we need to be talking more about power and how power operates. And you've done such a brilliant job of illustrating how relations of power have led us to the multiple converging crises that we faced. And I think we need to also be um, teaching about this and talking about how power operates to block change and how, um, the familiar patterns of denying that there are problems, uh, pitting activists and movements against each other, right through to co-opting activists into processes of royal commissions that take five years to deliberate, whose recommendations are mostly ignored and piecemeal reform without adequate enforcement that take another five or 10 years because they threaten certain vested interests that already that tail end of the process alone has bought another 10 years of business as usual. We need to be talking about these things. We don't have any courses in our public health programs that address these things because this is what we need to grapple with when we think about how to make change.
And I think I've gone over time. There were other things I wanted to say, but thank you so much for this opportunity and for the brilliance of your work. Yeah, thanks so much, Blake. Um, I'm gonna turn to Carlos next to offer some reflections. And um, there's some questions coming in, but I'd need my participants to keep thinking about your questions. I feel very, very honored to be here with you to talk alongside Dr. Rupa Maria and Dr. Blake Poland. In the past presentations, we have heard about the importance of care, stories, metaphors, borders, capitalism, and colonialism for helping us understand health in a global context and supporting us in imagining alternative solutions to the multiple crises we are facing. In my response, I want to connect these ideas with a story and two sayings I heard from Enrique Enciso, one of the founders of Un Salto de Vida, or A Leap of Life a grassroots environmental collective in El Salto, Mexico, just south of where I used to live in Guadalajara. I believe this story and sayings contain valuable teachings for me and others in global health research. The story goes like this. The year is 2005. In the town of El Salto, people can tell the direction of the wind just by, playing, just by paying attention to their sense of smell. This is no magic. After, after years of being surrounded by different sources of pollution, people in El Salto can easily recognize their, their unique smells. If there is an acidic smell, the wind is blowing from the north. This smell comes from a landfill and the juices of the trash, also known as leachate. If the smell is that of rotten eggs, the wind is coming from the south. The smell comes from the decomposition of organic matter in raw sewage that is dropped into the Santiago River. Unfortunately, pollution is not only felt through the nose, but through respiratory disease, renal disease, skin ailments, and seeing friends and family dying at an, at an early age. However, this is not only a story of suffering, but also a story of resistance, dignity, care, and love. After 17 years of ongoing or organizing, people in El Salto have stopped the construction of new sources of pollution and found partial solutions to some of their issues. In their organizing processes, they have used sayings that analyze what is going on in their territories and help establishing more respectful relationships among locals and external allies. One of these sayings is one that is commonly used by farmers. Las gallinas de arriba cagan a las de abajo. It can be roughly translated to the hens up top, poop on the hens at the bottom. We use the saying to describe the relationship between people in the city of Guadalajara, whose raw, whose raw sewage used to go directly into the Santiago River and move downstream to El Salto. There is a circularity to this saying. As the polluted water goes downstream, it is used to water crops, which are later packaged and sold back to Guadalajara. The hens up top are being damaged by their own poop too. At a deeper level, this saying is teaching us about power relationships and entanglement. A second related expression is los solidarios asalariados which can be roughly translated to the salaried supporters. This expression describes people who get paid to do activism, research, or health programs. It highlights a key distinction between people in El Salto and those of us interested in working with them. People in El Salto experience the long-term and cumulative impacts of one of the most polluted regions in Mexico. Un Salto de Vida members frequently affirm that they are not activists nor environmentalists. There are just people defending ecosystem and human health. In other words, their struggle is a necessity, not a choice. When I think about the salaried supporters, I think about the critical distance that Un Salto de Vida members have learned to establish between themselves and those of us who are choosing to work with them. They know that our work does not necessarily stem from necessity, but from the agendas of the organizations that fund our work and our livelihoods. I've been reflecting on the implications of returning to Mexico after some six years in Canada and reestablishing my relationships with Un Salto de Vida, this time as a salaried supporter, as a global health researcher. I think about the dominance of Eurocentric perspectives in academic disciplines and the need to frame our research projects in ways that make sense to the English speaking academia. I think about the privilege of being in El Salto when I choose and returning to the comforts of the global north when I want. I believe, that saying, I believe that the saying about the hands and the salaried supporters have valuable and challenging lessons. However, these sayings could easily be overlooked by Western science 
and deemed to have limited value. What would it take to see these sayings as valuable concept metaphors? What would it take to see their contributions for describing reality, analyzing it, and promoting respectful relationships? In the global north, concepts such as sustainability, development, and nation state, state act as epistemic blinders. We can rarely think, feel, or imagine beyond them. We feel that all communities and nations should desire progress through science and technology and emphasize human-led actions. However, not all communities share these concepts and desires. In the case of El Salto, people are feeling forced to defend human and ecosystem life rather than seeking sustainability. People are resisting capitalist development because the promises of multinational industrialization in their towns only left pollution, death, and economic dependency. It is becoming increasingly evident that Western knowledge traditions are insufficient for addressing the current ecological and social crisis. In the context of global health research, we have the opportunity to learn from indigenous, black, peasant, and popular communities from across the world. Yet, there is a lot of unlearning to do. It is imperative to critically examine our own biases, assumptions, and desires. This is not only a matter of reflexivity, but a matter of familiarizing ourselves with the limits and assumptions of mother reason, as they remain at the core of Western ways of knowing and being. I thank you so much for having me with you today, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Carlos, for those wonderful remarks, and um, really, the you illustrated beautifully the power of storytelling and bringing to life um, very the human connections, which connected to Blake's comments around reconnection, resilience, recentering relationships, and making room also for different ways of knowing. Um, uh, so we've got a number of questions, um, and perhaps I'll start with the one that was posted first. Uh, and so lots of um, accolades, um, Rupa, for, um, for your, your presentation um, and how Inflamed is such an important piece of work. So the first question from Samir is, given that this is a lectureship in global health, uh, can, can you speak to the harm caused by philanthropic capitalists in medicine and healthcare, both historically. So examples, of course, Carnegie, Rockefeller, and of course, in our present day context, Gates, both locally and globally. So any thoughts? And so maybe Rupa, um, maybe I can invite you to start um, off, but Carlos or Blake, if you have comments to add, please do so. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And Carlos, that was beautiful. And Blake, thank you so much for your reflections. <clears throat> Samir, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think the only good that those people can do is, is give their money away um, and to give their money away to the people who've been harmed. And that's basically what they need to do. Um, unfortunately, um, the attempts to, um, you know, guide the future of health or the future of farming, Gates is now the largest landowner in, in the United States or is it the world? I can't remember. <laughs> He's buying up farms, um, which is, you know, ridiculous. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that the, the only value of these uh, philanthropists is to give away their money, um, specifically starting with, you could start with, you know, reparations to Indigenous communities. I hope that helps, but I have nothing really left to say about that. We know the dirt that they're doing and we know that how they're, um, you know, trying to secure their relevance in the future. And, and there is no relevance for, there is actually no relevance for capitalism. And then we need to get comfortable with that, Blake, you said, like the C word. Um, we need to get really real about what is what is causing these things um, and and to name it. And that, that is a naming of power discrepancy. Um, and it's wonderful to hear, you know, um, Carlos, you describe the, the literacy that your community, the community down in the South has, and that literacy is, is so important um, because it allows people not to accept, you know, um, substitutes for, for real health. Just to, yeah, just to, just to build on that, I'm struck by, you know, the notion of indulgences, the, the way in which philanthrocapitalism kind of secures its own indulgences or renders magnanimous <laughs> those who profit mightily from the systems that they then, you know, propose to fund technical solutions to, while at the same time securing the 
narrow uh, framing of the issues in terms of what is frankly the dominant modus operandi in public health, which is risk management. And risk management to me is all about managing the fallout from dominant systems in ways that allow those systems to go unnamed and unaddressed. And it has been the dominant modus operandi in public health. And I think we need to be starting to call that out <laughs> in, in very key ways in the work that we do. Yeah, thank you, Samir, so much for this question. I think it's, it's very important because in many ways, uh, philanthropic capitalism keeps affirming, affirming the same model of progress through capitalist development. And we have uh, seen that it has led to a lot of damage to people, planet, animals, and all beings. And so in, in Rupa's presentation, uh, she mentioned the word of the pluriverse. And I think this word is very important because it makes us think about all the diversity of ways of knowing in the world and how uh, many peoples have lived in very unique ecosystems and adapted ways of living and of knowing just right for those ecosystems. And I think we need to pick up those bundles and, and start reconnecting with that ancestral wisdom. Yeah, and if I can just add, I think beyond the financial power they wield, they wield a lot of epistemic power and because they privilege certain kinds of knowledge um, by virtue of their agenda setting power and where they sit at various tables. So well, um, I would, thank you. Can I, can I just yeah. add to that? Because I've been in a conversation with some folks at the Rockefeller Foundation because they're very interested in our work with the D-Medicine Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and their food system people have said, you know, this is the most holistic uh, food system change model we've ever seen. And, you know, would you be interested in being part of a project where your community would sit down in the same room as, you know, the Walmarts and the Nature Conservancy visions of regenerative agriculture? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not really proper to ask the victims of genocide to sit there with people who are continuing the same genocidal worldview to explain to them why their, their worldview is damaging. And that really gets to, again, this cosmology. Um, these are competing, they, are, they can't exist in the same space um, because one cosmology is centering care and the other is sundering care. Um, and and those, those things need to be, you know, it is time for us to, to sit and go, which one is going to predominate here on planet earth how are we going to move forward on a planet that's on fire with with that and so it's been a very interesting engagement for for me um because there's this they that the, the folks in the food system know that the work that's coming out of indigenous food traditions the work the work that's coming i mean the science is showing that indigenous communities do better at all the things that make people healthy on planet earth right and so if we know that and they're like oh well what can we extract from that? What can we gain from that? Oh, let's just call it regenerative. Let's just get some cows and change a couple things. Again, like reform without revolution. Um, and so that was my response to them is you, you, if you really want to change, you have to put your full weight behind agroecology and the indigenous food system. Don't even invite the capitalists to the table. It's time to like put all the weight there. And they just looked at me dumbfounded. Um, but that's like, those are the conversations that really need to happen. And it's I, I'm, I'm fine to engage with it if it will make them loosen their grip on their money to put the, you know, get rid of the chokehold to, to take that stolen money and put it back in the hands of people who've been most damaged um, so that people can start to move um, and change their own material realities. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just go to the next question, if I may. So Nicole is asking about this concept of one health that's been proposed as a holistic approach to considering health and how it relates to the environment, which seems to mirror indigenous teachings more than Western medicine. However, there have been criticisms of this one health approach um, that it was actually really birthed from a Western point of view and often fails to use indigenous teachings in, in their solutions. So given your expertise and experiences, what are some ways that we can ensure a one health approach or a similar holistic approaches are not steamrolled by this colonial capitalist mindset. Um, maybe I can start with Carlos first or Blake, unless you're chopping off the bit, <laughs> Rupa, and you wanted to comment. That's really fine. Sure, uh, yes. In the last year, I have been learning a lot from uh, indigenous and critical scholars who have been reflecting about uh, 
what can be the conditions for sharing knowledge in a respectful way across different knowledge systems? And there are different concepts that can help us think about this. One of them is the ethical space as advanced by Akri Elder, uh, Willie Ermin, and Jack, Dr. Janet Smiley in the context of knowledge translation. Another one is the concept of eruaptumum or two eyed seeing uh, by Elder Albert Marshall. Another one is the uh, ecologies of knowledges uh, by Boaventura de Sousa Santos. And so some of the commonalities that I have noticed among all of these uh, concepts, teachings, or ideas is that they propose that there are some assumptions about knowledge and about interacting among knowledge that are very important to keep in mind and to make present in order to foster respectful engagements. Because for a long time, Western knowledge has seen itself as universal and all encompassing. Uh, and this has created a lot of appropriation and imposition uh, of knowledges. And so uh, what, I found, uh, what I found in common is that um, many of them are calling to see all ways of knowledge as local, none can be universal. All, of, all forms of knowledge are necessarily incomplete. There's no need to aspire to totalizing forms of knowledge. And because all forms of knowledge knowing are local and incomplete, all of them are also valuable. And if we come together uh, with assumptions like this to share on our engagements, we will be much more able to foster respectful engagements. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Rupa or Blake, would you like to comment? Yeah. Um... I think this is really interesting and difficult space because so often the politics of appropriation and co-optation have walked, you know, hand in hand. And so often mainstreaming has involved a de-radicalization as part of, you know, the alignment of critique uh, over time with, you know, how it gets absorbed into the broader po body politic in ways that allow it to not fundamentally unseat the dominant paradigm, but somehow get grafted in and in the process lose a lot of the, the radical edge. And I think also um, um, contribute to the co-optation and burnout of a lot of activists who initially are very excited about fertile ground for their ideas, but as that process unfolds, uh, rapidly discover that the, the, the taking, and it is always a taking, is very selective and very much reframed in terms of the dominant paradigm. So uh, it's, it's work that I think needs to happen and at the same time is deeply problematic and fraught with pitfalls. I think of it similarly to regenerative agriculture. So we're talking regenerative agriculture without regenerating the relationships that made the land healthy, which is, it was under indigenous sovereignty. It's native people's land here in this area. Um, <clears throat> and so naming the ideas without naming the context of power so when I look at the One Health stuff, I don't see any naming of capitalism. I don't see any naming of land theft, of labor theft, of coercion. I don't see any of that. So um, it's taking the idea without the root. Um, and so it's going to be inherently flawed. Um, again, a reformist thing. This is like the performative anti-racist gestures we're seeing throughout medicine right now, where the you know C-suite remains intact. It's mostly white men. Um, the low wage labor is mostly brown and black people. Um, and so those axes of power haven't changed, but now we have more performances and more, more words to feel better. Um, so I think that it's, it's critical in those spaces to constantly bring it back to, um, the, the power, uh, the power dynamics of racial capitalism. Um, and I don't see that in that language, so I don't really take it very seriously. Yeah, I think it's a great point how frames can actually render invisible the systems of power and oppression and as critical scholars our responsibility is to rend them and continually to rend them visible and call them out um, and call for dismantling of those structures thank you um, the next question um, is from kamori really enjoyed reading inflamed is it also possible that the reimagining of a world beyond the colonial capitalist cosmology promotes the unlearning of generational learned helplessness 
generational poverty, consciousness, and ultimately inequality. Maybe Rupa, I can start um, start with you. Yes. <laughs> That's a big question. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, well, obviously, and I think you're seeing it already in communities um, and in moments of movement work um, where people are coming together and doing things like Carlos described like, through organizing, um, through organizing and understanding that our material realities can be changed through our collective work. It actually can't happen as individuals. We can't unlearn this helplessness on our own. It's not our own fault. It's, a, it's again, a systems level um, phenomenon. And so that can be addressed through our collective, collective work. Um, and what's been beautiful is looking at the collectives, the network and nodes of these collectives around the world, whether it's those Zapatista communities in um, Mexico or the, you know, autonomous communities in Exarchia, Greece, or the work down in, you know, the Tekra slums in Ahmedabad, India, like there's all these different groups around the world who are unlearning this helplessness, mm -hmm. who, who are creating systems of mutual aid, who are um, creating, again, care-based economies. Um, so, and I think it doesn't happen if you, you know, keep putting your kids in the same school system and keep believing, you know, they have to be educated or participate in the same institutions. I think it must happen through dual power. It must happen through creating alternate institutions and alternate universities and alternate um, medical schools and places where we have deep medicine schools and that you can't expect to keep going to the same systems where you're being brainwashed and, and hope to have a different outcome. Um, so that's why it's it's necessary while we're in these institutions to maintain our skepticism and to maintain our critical um, voices and to, you know, bring people along with us and keep building on the outside with communities who are already doing this work and in, in service of their leadership. Thank you. Lake, Carlos, anything to add? I, I just think um, I really enjoy both the question and and uh, Rupa's response. And at the same time, I, I find myself quite compelled by the work of UBC's Vanessa Andriotti, who reminds us that even our unlearning work is so shot through with the fundamentals of modernity that it, it, it remains a project that can never be pure in any real sense. The unlearning is always partial and always contextual. And um, and modernism shows its face in so many aspects of sustainability and health work um, in terms of the, the deep and often hidden assumptions that, that drive this work. And that's not to throw all of it out as being therefore corrupt and, and you know, we'll just throw up our hands and wait for the collapse, but but rather just to bring a certain humility to the whole project that this is deeply problematic work that we are all you know impacted by racist colonization despite our you know the extensive white privilege <laughs> that some of us have and um and that this will be uh, the work of lifetimes and uh, and very urgent at the same time yeah, and I would like to echo uh, a little bit of what Rupa said about already existing alternatives, because we can see how many communities, especially those who have lived on under the darker side of modernity, the worst impacts of colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, are already uh, affirming uh, their own ways of living in non-capitalistic uh, ways. And so I think for uh, for those of us working in, in global health, it can be a challenge because many times we may think that the solutions for other parts of the world uh, would be if uh, ways of doing things in the global north could be exported to the global south. Uh, but in many cases, this is not just not the case. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important to be, um, to have these tensions present and also uh, just to be aware of, of this continuous dialogue in, in shifting the way that we think about the world. I don't see any more questions, but maybe just to pick up on these last few strands and actually just based on a recent article that I came across in, in a global health journal, 
So we have heard a lot, this is not new, but it's finally taken hold, this rhetoric around decolonizing global health research policy practice, which includes the academy. But some, some of us are getting very skeptical about how, how this project is actually being co-opted by the very systems that really need to change. Um, so I would just love to hear your thoughts just as we have a few more minutes left. Um, that's, I guess, cynic, cynical, my perspective, but at the same time, we do have an opportunity to pivot, but, at, but the way in which this sort of language and one could apply EDI projects as well to the mix, um, they become too instrumental um, and are not really looking at dismantling those structures. Um, we we may not be any further ahead 20, 30 years from now. So thoughts on that just, um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I know it's a big question, but I think it's really, again, it's a it's quite central to what we're talking about in global health. Um, yeah, and I think this is an important question and um, it goes to that last slide that I showed, you know, can a system mm -hmm. that was built to dominate be tweaked enough? No, it can't. Can a hospital, a colonial capitalist hospital be decolonized? No, can't. And when I'm in there, should I mitigate harm as much as I can with my colleagues? Yes, I should. Should I, <clears throat> you know, throw my life at trying to <laughs> decolonize this extremely racist, violent space? No, like I, I, I won't be able to, I, I and all of my friends can't do that um, because it's built on certain principles and practices what that and that speaks to dual power so what that means is are we building with the deep medicine circle and our native and non-native friends a clinic to decolonize medicine on that farm yeah we are are we doing work um with our community members who are already practicing deep medicine yeah we are so like that that i i don't think that we can comfortably feel like we can decolonize it might, might make us feel better about our work but it's not honest and and i think it's important that we are very honest about that. Um, and, and again, I, I also think that it's critical that we do have this um, critical analysis and this um, reckoning of ourselves in our work. Um, but I also think that, you know, that's why Fanon left the hospital, because um, a doctor was always part of the landowning class. Um, that's, that's just, a, that's the structure of it. And, 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 you know, if we are building alternatives that show that they're better, um, will that other system collapse? Probably, because everyone's going to want to do what's, what works better. Um, and those things have to be led by impacted communities. They have to be led by, um, you know, not the doctors, not the researchers, not the academics. It's not, it's not our job. Our job is to follow and to use our skills to um, uplift that, that work. That's, that's, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, no, thank you so much for um, so, Carlos or Blake, um, and then we'll wrap things up. Thanks. Any thoughts? I think that was so well said. I don't have anything to add. Okay. <laughs> uh, Blake, anything else to add? No, I, I just think, you know, these, these things are fraught and problematic, and yet we can't avoid um, engaging and we bring the critical analysis and our best attempt to work with um, affected communities and to center other ways of knowing in the traditions of the, the kind of epistemic justice that Carlos was talking about. Um, and the work will always be necessary and partial at the same time. But I'm really glad that we have these spaces to explore this and and to and Rupa, your work has been so fantastic at really putting the finger on so many pieces of this. So thank you. Yeah. So um, on behalf of um, the Center for Global Health and Andrea and I are so appreciative of all three of you for engaging in this critical dialogue, which could go on for hours. But I think it, as you said, like very important to create these kinds of spaces. Thank you so much Rupa, for that inspirational talk and, and also integrative talk, because I think too often we see little slices um, of these issues. And I really appreciated how you brought the many different facets that really should be at the table and thinking about the kinds of societies we want to 
create um, in the future and are already being created through these alternatives um, are so critical. So thank you so much for inspiring us for, with your work. And Carlos and Blake, thank you for your very thoughtful um, comments in response.